Hi, welcome back to the Woodshop Nerdery. In this video, I share with you six tips that I use in a free software called Inkscape to create project plans like this one. In this case, I'm building a Hans Wenger JH512 folding rope chair. Hans Wenger was a furniture designer active in the mid 20th century. That's mid-century modern to most YouTubers today. But if you're not a YouTube content creator, you may just think of this style as grandma's old dining room table. To put it in basic terms, like most mid-century modern furniture, Wenger's designs present a clean handcrafted appearance with a focus on quality construction. This video is the first in a series covering design and planning, sizing and shaping, joinery and assembly, and finishing and weaving. If you stick around, I'll show you the plans and show you those tips on the computer. Tip number one, do your research. I found a great reference in the June 2017 issue of Popular Woodworking. This article by Caleb James covers the construction of his take on the Wenger design. You can see he even has a picture of the JH5112 chair. He gives some details about how to construct that hinge hardware from common hardware parts. That's going to be invaluable. But I don't want to follow these plans per se because, well, I just prefer Wenger's original design over the modification Mr. James has made here. Another great resource is this video from Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restoration. I really do like this channel, and as you can see, I'm a subscriber, and I've given the video a thumbs up. If you would take a moment to consider subscribing to this channel and clicking the thumbs up button, I'd really appreciate it. Here, Mr. Johnson is explaining the repairs that need to be done and beginning to disassemble the chair. This video is really helpful for me since I have to design my plans from scratch. I can see all these details up close. There's other videos on YouTube, which I'll have to refer to later on when I'm weaving the seat. Here's a video discussing weaving Danish cord. And personally, I prefer the Danish cord look and feel over the caning. And of course, Google image searches are very helpful as well. For example, if I type in JH512 folding chair at google.com and switch to the images tab, I get a whole range of images at different angles. And these are very helpful and I'll use some of these for my project. But what I'm really looking for is something with dimensions. So it's critical that I find an image like this that gives me some idea of what I'm dealing with as far as size. This image is on a website of a company that reproduces the Hans Wenger chair. And if I scroll down, I'll find it here. Tip number two, load the reference material into Inkscape. So I wanna make sure I right click here and save the image, or I can copy the image if I like. In either case, my goal is to bring that image into Inkscape, which I've done here. And in my project, I've already gone ahead and drawn boxes around these key dimensions. With those dimensions set, I could then copy these rectangles and then superimpose them on top of other images, which I could scale to the correct proportion. And once I have the correct scale, I can start bringing in even more images with more details. Because I've scaled these images to the correct size, I'll be able to trace over this line work to produce drawings of each individual part. Here you can see the chair folded up and folded up on the side view as well. Maintaining the full scale size of those parts, I can make copies and place them over pages that will print out on my printer. So let's create a new drawing so I can show you how to load these images in from scratch. To load images, I can either paste them in from the clipboard or I can import them from a file. I'll show you examples of each. To demonstrate the copy paste technique, I'll go back to the website that has the dimension to line drawing. I'll right click on it in my Chrome browser and select copy image. If I go back to Inkscape, I can right click and select paste and the image will appear. Now at this point, it's very important to click the padlock button. This will preserve the aspect ratio of the image no matter how I size this, the height and width will say relative to the original aspect. The other option for adding images is to go to the file menu and select import. In the dialog box, I can navigate to my folder where I've stored my source material. And here I have several reference photos. I'll choose this one as something useful. And then I'll add another one. And I'll add yet another one. Tip number three, scale the reference material to the same real world reference measurements. 
So now you can see I have my reference photos in here, but they're all different sizes. I just can't start drawing on top of these images because one, they won't match the real world size that I need in order to print templates. And two, parts drawn on this image will be a different size to the parts drawn on this image, will be a different size to the parts drawn on this image. So I need a way to scale these images so that all of them match a real world reference. And that's why this image is so important here. So I'll start by making sure my units are set to millimeters because I believe the units on this page are millimeters. And I'll start with drawing a box. I'm using the rectangle tool here on the left. I'll switch to the selector and with it selected, I'll type in the dimensions. So let's say we wanna do a rectangle for this part of the image. We know that the width is 74 millimeters and the height is 75 millimeters. So now it's time for a gut check. If this page is eight and a half by 11 inches, did I choose the right units for this box? No, I didn't. So I have to challenge my assumption here. Actually, these are most likely centimeter values, not millimeter. So it's easy to change that to centimeter. So I'll go 74 centimeters. And I'll need to temporarily turn off the locked button so I can change the size of this rectangle independently for now. So now I could set the height to 75 without forcing a change in the width. Okay, so now I have my rectangle. I'll wanna move these other images out of the way. And I want to start to size this image so that the image fills the rectangle. And I find it easier to turn off snapping I have to zoom out. As you can see, there's a lot of trial and error here, but it's getting close. Okay, so I did have to do some stretching of the image horizontally to get a best fit, but the name of the game here is consistency. So now I can draw a rectangle around this item. And you can see as I drew that rectangle, if I come up here, the width is very close to the 99 centimeters. So that tells me I've got it about right. Now I can copy this rectangle, paste it over here, and I could use it to size this unrelated image. And notice I'll have to stretch the image horizontally again to get a best fit. Tip number four, use contrasting colors for visual clarity. Using these same techniques, I went ahead and resized the remainder of the images. But because the images are black and white and my rectangles are gray, what I wanna do is change that to red. I'll select the rectangle, but if I come down here and just choose red, you can see it changes the entire fill to red. So what I actually wanna do is change the stroke. If I double click on the stroke, on the right hand side, it'll bring up my stroke paint dialog. And I'll click the area of the wheel it contains the color I'm interested in. And when the triangle is pointing to that color, I can then click anywhere within the field of that color to get the variation. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, that's gonna be a little easier to see. I may also want to increase the stroke style. Let's say I wanna change that to pixels and I want it to be exactly two pixels. Now, if I go to the edit menu and select copy, I can then select the other rectangles in my drawing, select the edit menu again, and select paste style. So now you can see all my rectangles are red. Tip number five, draw right on top of those reference images and use the curve tool to create exact shapes. So now I wanna draw this support frame. But if you think about it, the chair in this image is opened up, which means that that frame is at an angle, which also means it's going to appear smaller in height than it would otherwise. So I have to carefully select which portion of the images I'm gonna to use to draw that. Well, it appears over here, there's a version that's completely perpendicular to the frame of view. And I see that there's these sort of dotted lines here kind of showing a point of symmetry, meaning that everything to the left of this dotted line is symmetrical with everything on the right. And that's gonna be very helpful for me because if I were to try to freehand draw this curve here, for example, I may not get the slopes and curves exactly the same on the left side as I would the right. But 
If I only focus on one half at a time, I'll be able to duplicate that side, flip it reverse, and move it over here to complete the image. So let me show you how I'm going to do that. On the left hand side, I'll click the curves tool and I'll just start drawing. What I like to do is get the major line work in first and then come back and tune it up later. Again, so I can see that better, I'll go ahead and make the stroke color red. I'll make sure I can see it well at a two pixel width. So zooming in, now I need to better fit this line to the curve of the line shown in the image behind it. To do that, I'll select the Edit Paths by Node tool. And I can just click and drag, start moving the curve onto the line. You can see here it's not fitting very well, so I'll go ahead and use the handles to get it to line up a lot better. And it looks like in this section I could use another node, so I'll double click. And I can move that node over. Again, drag the line for the best fit. Now this line seems to follow the path of the image fairly well, so I'll leave it alone. Maybe nudge this node over a little bit. But this line I'll click and drag, try to get it to match the curve. I have a little bit of a sharp angle here. Maybe that'll correct as I match this line up. Since this seems to be one continuous curve here, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this node. I'll select it and then click up here on the toolbar, the Delete Node tool. It's much easier to let the computer figure out the curve than it is to figure it out yourself. Okay, and then I would just keep playing with that until I was happy. As I draw those parts in Inkscape, I'm frequently referencing the images and the videos to make sure I'm capturing any of the nuanced details that are not evident directly in the line drawing. I'm more or less happy with that for now. So now what I want to do is select it, click Control-C on my keyboard, then click Control-V to paste a copy of it, and I'll come up here to the toolbar and use the Flip Selected Objects horizontally. If I click that, you can see that it's flipped it. And now I can line it up here, and between the two I have a complete part. I'll tell you what, I'll select these and paste them into an empty area so we can see them better. So there we have it. A completely symmetrical part. So if I keep using the tools this way, I will eventually build up the curves of each of these individual parts. And ultimately, I'll have all the details of each individual part mapped out. Tip number six, use multiple pages to create full-scale templates. Now let me show you how to deal with the pages. So here, now that I have this part drawn, I need to print it out, but I only have this one little page. So in the newest version of Inkscape, this has become much easier. That'd be version 1.2. On the left-hand side, there is a Create and Edit Page Documents tool. I'll click that, and it'll bring up a new toolbar here where I can click the Add Page button. So I'll just keep adding pages. I'll select and drag them so that there's some height to it. So just want a little bit of overlap on each of these pages. That way, when I print them out, I won't get any margin cutoffs. Okay. Next, I'll move my drawing right over here. So when I print the, this out, each page will contain a portion of the ultimate image, and I'll be able to cut them up and tape them together for a full-size template. 
I couldn't find any pre-made plans for building this exact chair, so I had to create my own from scratch. And because of all the unusual shapes and design elements, it was no easy task. Let me show you a little more about these plans. I have the major components listed here with the broad dimensions in millimeters listed. This is the front view with the chair folded up, and this is the side view with the chair folded up. And then there's a small detail here which shows the cross-section profile in this section. Because I have an 8.5 by 11 printer, I have to break any full-size templates across individual sheets. This shows a full-scale section of the seat area and the back leg and backrest. I'll be able to splice these together, tape them up, and they'll make great full-size templates.